Served his uh, BS and MS degrees in mechanical engineering from MIT and uh, his PhD in aerospace engineering from University of Michigan. And uh, his, uh, he's also MS in management at Sloan Fellow, uh, as a Sloan Fellow at the Stanford Graduate School of Business. So uh, he's going to talk today about the challenges and opportunities for systems engineering in industrial sectors. Uh, Yes, so after the seminar uh, uh, in 401, uh, we can all arrange and uh, we can definitely copy and uh, notes and uh, we can follow up with on this one more discussion. Thanks, sir. All right, thanks very much. So thanks for thanks for having me. Thanks for coming here on a nice uh, Thursday morning. Yeah, Actually, usually the students don't come until 11 or 10. So. Oh, so, uh, you know, it's the same thing. You can see the schedule it properly. <laughs> so, so UTRC is the same thing. We always have meetings that start on the hour. We have people come in for seminars. And I always tell people, don't worry if no one shows up. <laughs> people will be OK. So and then it's the same thing everywhere. So that's fine. Um, so you have a nice show up at 7.30 in the morning? There's no, absolutely no one here. Yeah. So, so like this is early for me. It's early yeah. for academia. I, I, I usually work, work from home. That's when I get my work done. So, <laughs> so I rush to that. So uh, uh, Isaac Cohen, my boss, who's the uh, department lead of uh, systems at UTRC, is supposed to give this talk. He, unfor he unfortunately had to travel, so he asked me to come give this. Uh, so hopefully it's just How long have you been at UTRC? Uh, I've been at UTRC about a year. OK. Um, but I, I, I had uh, come to see yeah. Isaac and then see that. Yep. Yeah. Uh, so I've been there about a year. Before that, I was with uh, like, like um, Air, Force. Uh, Air Force Research Lab. Um, so made the switch about Who did you work with at MIT? You were in aerospace or? In aerospace, yeah. Okay. Uh, so I'm gonna I'm gonna just talk about two things. One, I'm gonna give a little bit of an overview about UTRC, um, just to highlight it, uh, you know, get some information out there. You know, we are hiring, and so if they have some interest in that, please come see me after. And then I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, some. Uh, I'm gonna show a case study that shows some an example of some systems engineering where we use optimization to, to solve kind of an interesting problem in the business unit. Uh, and then I'm gonna talk about some of the challenges. So the, the takeaways I'd like you to get. Are that you know this is an application where we really um, we're focused on solving a real problem for the business unit. And system engineering is very helpful to us, uh, and this is something that the UTC is very interested in. We want to uh, kind of in a, in a formalized way, uh, and that there's still a lot of challenges that exist. So I want to acknowledge the the folks who uh, really did this work and put this together. Uh, first two of the folks who really did the work: Ray Wan and Virginia Nabrabi. Um, we have some other folks who. Did kind of some supporting work. Uh, Todd Jacobson is our uh, senior fellow in control at UTRC. John Cassidy is a former director. He still stays very involved. And we're fortunate to have uh, lots of great uh, uh, university collaborators. And you know, we collaborate with, with folks in Utah as well. So United Technologies uh, is a big company uh, that a lot of people have heard of but don't know a lot about. So I wanted to mention that a little bit. And in fact, if you know we, if you're close to it, you probably know a little bit more about it. So it really has two sides. It has a building industrial side, which is uh, Otis, and then climate control security, which is mainly carrier air conditioner. Uh, they also have fire uh, fire security companies as well. And an aerospace side, which is Pratt Whitney, UT Aerospace Systems, which makes all the subsystems for aircraft. And until about a month ago, Sikorsky uh, helicopters. We actually sold Sikorsky to Lockheed Martin. Uh, as it turns out, in the research center, I think we're still going to continue collaboration with them. But from a business point of view, they're no longer part of it. So again, two sides to the house, and uh, uh, I, I heard described by one of the fellows at, uh, at UTRC that UTC really is an infrastructure company. You know, we don't make buildings, but we make all the stuff that makes a building operate. We don't make aircraft, but we make all the stuff that makes an aircraft operate from engines and all the systems from landing gear to environmental controls and security. So you can think about it like that, and that's that's sort of significant from a systems engineering point of view. 
because we are an infrastructure company, both on the building and on the aerospace side, all these systems kind of have to work together, and it's important that they be kind of designed um, in a systems engineering framework so that they, they work in support of an optimal life. Uh, here's just to give you a sense of the size of the company, it's about a $65 billion a year company, uh, and there's kind of a breakdown across the business units and across the globe in the sales. It's about split, uh, more or less half and half between aerospace and commercial. Uh, now that we've sold Sikorsky, I think the, the weight will flip a little bit. Uh, and the important point here is that uh, UPC invested almost $5 billion in 2014 on uh, company and customer funded R&D. So that most of that is not in UPRC, obviously. Most of that's within the business unit. But that's a significant amount of uh, investment in R&D. So UTC is very focused on, on the future uh, and on growth. Uh, and UTRC is the research center. We support all the business units. Um, and we are sort of known as UTC's innovation engine. So the two main things from this list that we really do are we define new frontiers, we look out and we think about areas that we know are going to be, or we think are going to be important to the business in the future. Um, and sometimes uh, this is helpful to business units because they're more focused on the near term delivering the product. And we also solve tough problems for the business. Come to us and work with us, and a lot of our funding actually comes directly from the business units to solve these tough problems. So uh, th that's kind of the dual mission of UTRC. Uh, we do that by co-developing new technology. We work very closely with the business units. We actually have some people embedded in the business units uh, some of the time. Uh, so we understand their systems, we understand their needs, and we try to predict their future needs. We're a hub for technical interchange. Uh, we have this, you know, this global network of innovation. All these collaborators we have across the world. Uh, and of course, we want to monetize the uh, intellectual property. Could, could you start speak a little bit about the REM workshops? And that's, I know somebody that's interested in. So I don't know about that okay. specifically. I can find out for you, though, okay. get back to you. Yeah. But I know we do. I know there are a number of sort of uh, topics that we, we host workshops for. So we just had a, a workshop on additive manufacturing. Mm -hmm. So we have a manufacturing center. And you know that's an example kind of invite a lot of people in and sort of share. You know, it's like a mini mini conference kind of thing. So I think it's probably a similar thing for, for the rare earth round that comes to the show. Uh, most of our folks have advanced degrees. Uh, we're about 600 people across the globe. Uh, most of us are in East Hartford, uh, Connecticut. There's about 50 people in the Shanghai office, about 50 people in, uh, in an office in Cork, Ireland. There's also about a dozen people out. Uh, we have a small office in uh, Berkeley uh, near the Panda. Um, you know, I know you have something in Italy or something. Rome, right? Rome. Oh, we do. That's right. Now we have, that's right, thanks for reminding me. So we have about, I think we have about 40 people out there as well, right, right there, Alex, right there. So we're becoming in, sort of increasingly uh, globalized here. And the Cork office uh, is growing quite a bit because they're now, they had to focus on the building market in Europe, and now they're sort of shifting to also focus on the airspace market. So there's a lot of growth in the Cork office. So the, the key here is we really try to develop um, develop things in conjunction with the business units, and we, everything we try we do we want to have an impact. And so to have that impact, we have a very structured process for uh, innovation to capture new ideas and to develop those new ideas in kind of a rigorous way. And that process is very well tied in with the pro the uh, sort of the uh, task force process that the businesses use to develop their products. So. Um, so where do we get these ideas? Again, it comes from all our work in, with the business units and working on uh, collaborative projects and things like this. It comes from you know, all of our outreach and all of our conference participation and, and uh, participation in the technical community. Um, and, and this is what we consider this a key to success for United Technologies Research Center is this ability uh, and this really drive to capture new ideas from, from the entire staff and, uh, and to really draw uh, as many of them as possible. Um, here's some examples of some successes we've had. Um, one uh, development here, integrated high performance building, building systems. Uh, I'll show some examples where, where I talk about that. Uh, and one you, you may have heard of just because it was local, it's the, uh, the geared turbofan engine as well uh, from Pratt and Whitney. Uh, and there's some other examples as well. Uh, here's how we're structured. So we're three technical departments, um, thermal fluid sciences, physical sciences, and I'm in the systems department. 
And in the systems department, we are uh, really structured around five groups. So the power, line, power electronics group tends to focus on the hardware, uh, decision support and machine intelligence, that's the uh, focus on uh, uh, big data, human machine interaction, uh, things like that. Embedded systems is a software and sort of a sensor group. Uh, dynamic product optimization is name and apply, lots of modeling and optimization work. And I'm the group leader for control systems group. So we really focus on uh, you know, advanced methods, um, uh, advanced applications, uh, and also lately a lot of uh, verification and validation for systems, which is important on both sides, on the building and the aerospace side. Okay, so that's a little bit of an uh, overview of UTRC. As I said, we are you know, uh, definitely uh, looking to expand, particularly the systems department is looking to expand. If anyone has any kind of interest in, in talking about that, I'd be uh, kind of welcome to talk to them more about that, or if you know somebody who uh, so now I'm going to uh, switch to the second part of the talk. So as I mentioned, UTC is an infrastructure company. Um, and, you know, it's, it's one of the, uh, it's the largest ma uh, maker of approachability systems in the world. Uh, and so one of the focuses now lately is on energy efficient buildings. And what really drives that is two things. Uh, one is market conditions and one is uh, regulation, particularly in the European. But both of those things really require a much more energy efficient um, approach to building design and building operation. And so because of that, there's a lot of challenges, but there's also a lot of opportunities to, really, uh, to think about how we design these systems in a more integrated, more systems engineering way uh, to make that happen. Uh, so here's a, the takeaways I want to leave you with is that the system level engineering, and by that I mean the entire system, um, does, it does have a benefit. And, sort of a concrete benefit. Um, the particular area I'm going to talk about today is an optimization-based approach that can provide some additional capabilities, some techniques in, in designing some of these systems. And I'll show a, a sort of a simple example of that. The idea, the idea of the example is just to demonstrate the idea. Um, it's really uh, meant to be sort of expandable and scalable to, to more things. Uh, and then uh, the challenges, in terms of the challenges, um, things that really need more work in the future is uncertainty analysis and the ability to handle faults. So the ability to handle faults in a building is particularly important because um, when you imagine the complexity of a building system, the HVAC system and the electric power system, the, the opportunity for faults in those systems is huge. Um, and, and often they're not, uh, because it's not a sort of a safety critical system like an airspace system, uh, you know, you, you, you live with those. Everybody's been in kind of the situation where they're in an office where their HVAC doesn't really work well, or probably because of a fault, and uh, you know, it, that, that's the idea. So some open problems here, I'll, I'll kind of go through those at the end as well. So here's a little bit of an outline of what I'm going to talk about. And first I'm going to talk about uh, a little bit of context and then a problem definition. So as I mentioned, uh, the, big, the big problem here is that uh, uh, buildings consume uh, a lot of so in, in the U.S., buildings can serve, uh, consume about 39% of the U.S. energy, 71% of the electricity, uh, and most of the natural gas as well. And they also produce almost half of carbon emissions in the country. Um, so the, uh, the annual energy cost of the U.S. building is about $400 billion. And this wouldn't be so bad, except for that um, about 30% of that is wasted energy. It's energy that could be saved, uh, so that's about $120 billion that could be saved designed or operated more efficiently. Uh, and, and it's also the only sector that's sort of showing growth in the, in the energy usage, so that's kind of significant. So that's on the, on the kind of cost uh, side of things. Uh, and then, uh, you know, buildings across the world are sort of similar in that respect. Uh, in the European Union, though, there are actually uh, coming in the future regulations about energy efficiency of these buildings that are going to present significant challenges to designers and operators of buildings in the future in terms of uh, um, buildings having to produce as much energy as they use um, and you know, having kind of zero energy and zero emission buildings. Uh, just, just in a relatively short amount of time, I mean, 2019 and 2020 seem far away, but in terms of getting those technologies developed, that's a relatively short amount of time. So the message here is uh, we have to rethink how we do the system design and system operation um, or risk going out of business because someone, if we don't do it, someone will figure out a way to do it better. 
So there's a lot of potential for advancing, you know, uh, as a society here uh, and optimi optimizing these energy systems. Um, and unfortunately now, the way buildings are designed, um, systems engineering can only be in a, in a partial sense. Maybe going back to the previous chart, the, you mentioned European regulations. Are they uh, proposed or are they in effect? I believe they're in effect. They are in effect. Yeah. And is for new building. For new building. And are there going to be, do you know if any states, uh, any state in, within the U.S. is? Uh, I don't think so. Yeah, I don't think so. Or even California? Actually, California might. I'm not aware of any, but they, they I know they uh, obviously more focused on uh, energy standards and everything, so that, that's possible. Uh, but yeah, certainly, potentially, um, these things could be coming to us as well. So it's part of another giant leap uh, that will come. Uh, and at some point, it ages. Regulations always lag the growth, so the, the regulations in Asia will probably trump at some point as well. Uh, so, just to give a systems engineering definition, just from a UCT point of view, I think probably that's our definition. What's that? That's our definition. Oh, excellent. That's, that's good. Cool. Okay. Uh, I figured it would be. So, you know, everybody's sort of, sort of familiar with this. Uh, so, systems engineering is a process, it's a methodology for, for design uh, that focuses on requirements, breaking down the requirements, and the Functional architecture and then it's physical architecture. Uh, it uses model based tools. So, UTC is very focused now on model based tools, model based engineering. Um, and, and it's, uh, you know, it has these characteristics it's prescriptive, it's repeatable, and it's measurable. So, you can measure whether you're uh, meeting the requirements in terms of uh, verification. So, here is uh, just sort of a, a system level view of what a building is. So when most people think of a building system, they think of the physical building, the walls and, and whatnot. Um, and, and in fact, historically, that's sort of how buildings have been defined. You design, you build. Um, and, but it really, a building now, especially in a modern building, has many, many other things. So there's the HVAC, the lighting, uh, the electrical systems uh, that interact with the grid, uh, safety and security systems, and now you know sort of information management. So, so we were talking a little bit before about the opportunity and certainly the, the, you know, the chance to do that is going to increase in the future, but even now, the level of complexity is fairly large. Um, so traditionally, you know, the, the physical building is built, and then these other systems are sort of designed around that. And so I liken that to, so my background is control, and I liken that to, you know, typically, especially for an airspace system, typically a physical system is built to meet some performance requirements. So an aircraft, you know, the aircraft design is a design aircraft and then hand it over to the control engineer, and the control engineer is supposed to make it fly. Right? Well, that's not optimal. You know, what you really like to do is consider these things together. And so it's the same thing here, where you'd like to consider all these things together. And I'll show an example of this in the next slide. Um, and so that you know, not only is the building structure having an effect on all these systems, but the requirements for all these systems uh, may affect what the building structure looks like. You may be able to design these things together in such a way that as a whole, they operate much more efficiently. So are you looking at MDOs as a those types of? Th those, are, that's the idea, right? It's to look at these systems. These multi, and that's kind of the, that's kind of the long-term goal, is to look at these kind of MDO, multidisciplinary optimization approaches. And so that, that gets into ideas of, you know, architecture, exploration, evaluation, all these kinds of things. How's it making tools work for them? <laughs> yeah. Lot, there's lots of challenges. So here's some examples of where of uh, building systems that are uh, uh, become more energy efficient. So the Sheridan in Chicago um, looked at the looked at the system, did a retrofit with a chill plant, and were able to actually get uh, uh, a significant energy savings just through that design. So that's a, that's sort of a you know a currently designed system that was the old way that they were able to get some energy efficiency. And these are examples of buildings that, that uh, took this more systems engineering approach into account. There's a building at Tulane University that was able to use some of these, some of these different techniques, so uh, pore transferring, humidity control, uh, zoning, which is thinking of a building different zone, controlling those in a coordinated way, uh, more efficient lighting, shading, sort of an uh, you know, automated way, so you're closing the shade, you know, same way you do in a house, right? You close the shades in the summer when it's sunny, 
open up and then turn, turn and get those kinds of things. Uh, and they were able to get uh, a significant reduction over what the baseline building would have been. But the best example is this building in Bonn, Germany, where uh, they were able to get more than 50% reduction in, uh, in what the energy usage for a typical building of that size would be um, in, in a very novel design where they actually used the building structure itself to do some things like uh, energy storage. Uh, there was actually no fans or ducts at all in that building for HVAC. It was completely built to be a, uh, a much more energy efficient design, a very innovative design. Uh, and they used things like uh, predicting loads in terms of day and night cycles to be able to heat and cool the building much more efficiently. So what, how did they do the heating? Of, was it the floor itself? Uh, I believe so, yeah. Uh, and they do, it's a combination of, they do uh, obviously use energy for heating, I think, for the floor. But they do a lot of energy storage with, uh, with uh, slab uh, and using uh, sunlight as well. So how close do they come to the zero energy building target that you, you, know, you talked about earlier? So this, this one, I think, doesn't have any uh, uh, energy generation capability. So I don't know. That would be a good question. You know, you could potentially, I, I don't know uh, if you could make this a zero energy building by adding those kinds of things. It's, po it's certainly possible. I mean, it's more than 50 that would be sort of an interesting study to see how to do that. Because the zero energy thing depends on you know, having a building having some energy generation. Okay, so now I'm going to show a little example. Um, and the, the approach I'm going to show is sort of a general approach. And then I'm going to show an example of a very simple vapor compression system uh, just to demonstrate the idea. But the idea isn't really meant to be applicable sort of scalable to a much larger system. So this is the typical um, typical workflow or typical process that a designer would go through in, build, in designing some system. So a vapor compression system all the way up to a much more integrated building system. Uh, so you know, based on um, previous experience and previous knowledge, the designer would guess some design parameters and then do a, a system simulation. So here what I mean by simulation is steady state where we take the boundary conditions and kind of the desired inputs and see what the, what the steady operating condition of that system is. So it's not meant to be a simulation in a general sense. Um, and then um, and that's sort of uh, to, to see the, uh, the operating point. Uh, but then the challenging part of this is that there, uh, for a system, there will be a lots of uh, uh, boundary conditions, or not boundary conditions, uh, operating restrictions terms of some of the state variables, in terms of some of the outputs that the system will have to meet. And so the designer will check the, sy the system against those requirements. If it meets it, that's great. If it doesn't, they have to update the parameter in an iterative sort of ad hoc way and go back and do it. And so you get into this um, iterative loop where there's not a rigorous way to do it. And if you're not meeting the, the requirements, you sort of don't know um, designer doesn't have any useful information that can help him update those parameters. And so here's an example of some of the boundaries. So, you know, the, uh, a typical, so this is an example, jumping ahead to the example here of some uh, temperature for, for a plant, you know, it might have to operate within this envelope. Um, and so it's a, it's a fairly complex set of uh, So that's just to design uh, design a, a single system. Then if you want to do some optimization, you have to go through that loop a number of times. So you start with some design parameter. This block here is the iterative loop from the previous uh, slide. You go through that. You sort of check where you are in the, in the range. And you go through that a number of times to generate a number of points to finally find the best design. So it's very time consuming. It's very inefficient. It's very uh, and it doesn't give the user or the designer much direction in terms of how to alter the parameters. So it turns out this, this kind of problem lends itself well to the optimization framework. Um, so the problem before can be, can be framed like this. So what you're trying to do here, so F, F is the set of system equations. Uh, X is the state variables. Y is the set of control variables or control inputs. Uh, and theta here is a set of sort of boundary conditions. And I'll show an example later where this makes sense. So what you're trying to do is you're trying to find uh, the state variables that minimize and do 
difference between some control variables and the desired value of control variables? You mean a controlled variable is better than control? Uh, well, the output probably, right? right. Control variable, yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, uh, and you know, you can, you can uh, incorporate some constraints here. Uh, and then you set up these uh, sort of feasibility constraints and state constraints. And then you introduce these slack variables, Q and R, and you try to minimize this function. Uh, and if Q and R is zero, then you met all the feasibility constraints. And if it's not, then the optimization gives you some idea of which constraints are not you've, uh, you've sort of violated. And it gives you some direction on how to alter the result. So this is for the feasibility problem, just to, to see whether you can operate, um, whether the system can operate in a certain condition. And then we can, we can extend this um, into what we call targeting. And targeting really is to try to meet some performance uh, specification. So you can introduce the function C here, which is a perfor uh, performance function, and you change to where the slack variables now uh, are here, and, and you've got this constraint. Uh, and then the optimization problem then uh, now finds um, an operating point that meets that performance condition. So I'll show an example of this and it'll make more sense. So here's kind of the workflow now that the designer will have. Given some boundary conditions, you solve the feasibility problem, that first optimization problem, and that problem really solves, you know, can the system operate at that, at that current operating point? And if not, it'll show what the violation constraints are. Um, and if it does, you can sort of go on to the next thing, which is the targeting problem. So that gives you um, the, that solves the problem of finding uh, whether the system can reach some certain performance target. And then that leads into the optimization problem. And so here, um, given you can meet the, uh, given that the system can meet the performance criteria, the number of conditions, it finds the best from among those conditions to, to meet some optimization. So here's, this will make more sense after the example. Here's just a simple example of a vapor compression system. So it's a simple loop where you've got an evaporator and a condenser. You've got heat going into the evaporator and coming out of the condenser. Um, you've got a compressor. You've got the expansion valve. So there's 13 state variables here. It's basically the flows and uh, uh, pressures around the, around the loop. You've got three control variables. It's the, uh, the opening of the valve and two, uh, two variables uh, with the controls, the speed and the amount of mass going through the compressor. Uh, and you've got two boundary conditions. And the boundary conditions are the heat coming in uh, to the evaporator and going out of the condenser. So again, this is just a simple example that demonstrates the method. So you can go through and, uh, and you can find a set of feasible points. And the red, the red points, so here, you know, it's a three-dimensional problem, right? Because you've got three, uh, three control variables. But, uh, uh, so this is a slice with, with two of them showing the set of feasible points in, in uh, red. Uh, and then that blue sort of is the feasible set boundary. Uh, and then so for a, a certain capacity of uh, two megawatts, um, the, the black dots here indicate the set of operating points that meet that boundary condition. So that's the solution to the target problem. That's the set of solutions for that target. So now we take it to the next step and think about optimization. Um, and what we'd like to do here again, you know, you want to do some optimization because you'd like to operate back to the sort of beginning of the talk um, to the most optimal point and save the most energy. And so here uh, you've got some, so here's, this is the, the shot from the last slide. Um, so this is all this, the black dots here are the set of points that meet this two megawatt uh, capacity requirement. And the black dots here are actually the most efficient points of operation. So they tend to lie along that boundary. So the intersection of those two points, which is the solution right here, is the, uh, the, it's the design point that meets that two megawatt capacity most efficiently. So this is, again, going through that series of optimization problems, this sort of, uh, Takes you through an example. That is a robust solution, though. I mean, that is. Yeah, that's a good. So, 
So, and I'm going to get into that later. So this is for the nominal case, right? Uh, and actually, it's a good segue. Um, this is for the nominal case. Uh, and one of the areas we're going to get into, and I'm going to talk about in a minute, is what about the uncertain case? What if you've got some uncertainty in the variable? Um, how do you handle that? So that, just to jump ahead, that leads to kind of a ex much more complex um, optimization problem. And that's something we, actually, I'm going to talk about it right here. Um, so that was a good segue. So it's a much more compl complex optimization problem. And in fact, uh, this is kind of an important point in that uh, uh, for a number of reasons. So, um, so modeling a prediction of, for normal operation from a nominal system uh, is a challenging thing, but it's typically straightforward. You use physics-based models to do the model-based design, do the model-based optimization. Uh, but then there's two things that sort of break that down. One is that there's, uh, you can have failures in the system. So then you don't have a normal operation. Or you can have uncertainty in the model. And there's a lot of issues here, like I think we talked, we were talking about briefly before the talk. Um, you know, you often have, the example I showed is a straightforward thing, but you often have models from different domains coming together. So the model itself is sort of complex uh, and has a lot of uncertainty in it. So uh, as it says here, uncertainty is sort of a computational issue, and you have to think about it. One possibility for that within this framework is to sort of to modify the optimization problem here. So now you have a set of uncertain parameters. Uh, so the set is script U, and the elements of that set are UI here. Uh, and you now, you're trying to now minimize something else. So now you minimize this, uh, this objective function um, subject to, uh, you know, trying to also find within trying to meet all the constraints for all the uncertainty conditions. So you, it's basically, um, you have the uncertain set, and what you'd like to do is you'd like to make sure you meet all the feasibility constraints and then all the performance requirements uh, over that entire set. And so this is something we've sort of formulated and we're in the process of now investigating this. But this, this does take that to the next step of uncertainty analysis. So um, when you say to be uh, different from different, um, you know, the, what, a, what an engineer uh, has a model for a heat exchanger is going to be different than uh, a compressor or a compression <coughs> uh, Just the forms of the models, even the, the modeling tools that people use, and so um, combining these models has a, has a really add a lot of complexity. But these are, this is a static problem. This is a static problem. Right. derivatives here. Yeah. Right, yeah, that, this, right, exactly. This is all static. Value of minimizing with respect to the trace variables. Uh, so you, what you're trying to do here is you're trying to uh, uh, you find the state variable. So you find that op you're looking for that operating point uh, uh, that, that minimizes some cost. And then you look at the functional condition. Yeah. yeah. So basically, they they find a, a null up in the state space. Yeah. And then they go and find what the control. Probably should be minimum over x and y probably. <laughs> minimum over x and y, that's right, yeah. Uh, so, so that's sort of where we are. So that, again, it was just an example of, uh, of a more formal approach, a more optimization-based uh, based approach to systems engineering. Uh, it's a way to, and this is actually a real example that uh, uh, we're working with one of the business units to try to uh, transition, um, to try to give them some additional capabilities. So we're going to kind of continue to work with them on this. Uh, so many challenges and open opportunity modeling we already talked about. Uh, the diagnostics for the users within these optimization problems. Um, you know, the, the optimization framework gives the user, gives the designer some ability to understand if he's violating some constraints on the operation of the system, which ones he's, op he's uh, violating, and how to change the system in a useful way. Um, how to handle the constraints through the optimization framework. Uncertainty analysis we talked about, uh, and then of course computational <coughs> challenges too. So solving these problems, you know, solving the toy example here is not challenging with uncertainty in the state variables. But as we get into bigger and bigger systems, they need to be more uh, 
computation complexity. Uh, and it becomes much more of a challenge. And so this is uh, just a repeat of the, of the key points here from the start. So that's all I have. Looks like you're right at the design stage, though, in this particular right. formulation, right? right. And uh, how about uh, have you guys looked at the models of different uh, fidelity and things like that? Also, like how do you link? Because when you start your design yeah. process, things are going to be very vague, and right. And so, need to so that would be the next step. And, and the, so the example I gave here was for a particular application, and there's different uh, different examples of that. So it depends on the. It depends on the business unit, it depends on the application, the people, the, the groups at different sort of stages of maturity, mm -hmm. the differences. Uh, uh, and you mentioned the static versus dynamic too, so yeah. that's another sort of added layer of complexity too, which is important, right? I mean, the dynamics are important, um, and so that's something that you know, we need to get to with the, the sort of the dynamic aspect. Because what, what ends up happening is you design for steady state, and then you know, the dynamic performance. Now we go from one, one more to another more. residential building, typical house, what would be the dimension of uh, uh, the model? It would be uh, another probably at least an order of magnitude more so in the kind of So have you addressed any of those? Not yet. Not yet. So, yeah. And then industrial building would be? Would be even more. Yeah. Because yeah. yeah. then you know Simulation goals. I think uh, I, I, neither of those would be an easy thing, but I think uh, they would have had to use some sort of model based tools for prediction of, um, you know, especially the lows. Where, um, I don't know if they did the optimism model, but certainly for weather and things like that, they'd be modeling and, and you know, prediction and, and you know, it could be uh, uh, it's beyond scheduling. It's sort of a prediction of when things are going to happen and, and for, for the key force results. So you, uh, it's basically a computational expansion of the problem. So it's, uh, you, you think of this set of, uh, so now rather than a fixed value, you think of uh, parameters being in a range. And it, 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 what it's going to come down to is it's going to be a sampling. It'll have to be some sort of sampling based method to make sure the constraints are satisfied everywhere in that range. So it's just a yeah. scenario based. Uh, well, so this is uh, this is sort of um, um, you can uh, so you you gotta at some point you know it's uncertain right so you don't know but you gotta make a guess and you gotta uh, define some bounds that you wanna you wanna satisfy and then you know given how many parameters you choose or how many artificial bounds are the problem grows in complexity so it's the usual kind of trade off of complexity versus you know um, meeting all the performance. So are those um, uncertain parameters in the sense of potential faults that can occur in the system, not necessarily uncertain inputs? Or 
the start of the game? It could be either one. It could, could be, be uncertainty and uh, some physical characteristic of the system, yeah. and then a fault would be like a, dra a dramatic uh, version of that, where mm -hmm. something didn't work. So yeah. I think the model would match that. So they, they look different, and they could be handled different. The framework there sort of handled them in the same way, but you could also handle faults differently. And right. There's obviously lots of 